heard this joke before, but I, 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 I know what modern car is. I saw a guy that's like twice my size, dressed up as Thor. <laughs> God, I'm a big girl. Huh? Okay. Nancy's being sweet. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to the uh, Comic Con panel on what is modern horror. Um, my name is Hal Wagner. I'm going to be your moderator for the morning. Um, and what we're going to do is we're going to do a brief introduction to uh, me and our illustrious guests, and then we're going to uh, get on to uh, a discussion of what is modern horror. And uh, we have an hour, right? So uh, about 15 minutes before the end of the hour, uh, we'll start taking um, questions. But if you have a, a burning desire to know something and you think that we can answer your, your uh, meaning of life question midway through, raise your hand and we'll see what we can do. Um, okay, I'm Hal Bonner. I am a uh, retired entertainment lawyer. Um, I know I write full time. I wrote uh, most famously uh, uh, the best selling book, uh, Bike Club, which was a, uh, a gay comic vampire novel. Um, I read a lot of horror. I'm known mostly for horror, but I write uh, romance, which is uh, a paranormal romance, which is what pays the bills. And working from left to right. Let's start with Nancy. Hi, my name is Nancy Holder. I'm really happy to see you guys. Um, I'm a very proud member of the Horror Writers Association Los Angeles chapter. Um, in the, we're in the room and we would love to, if our fellow chapter members are here, if you want to talk to us, we have a booth downtown or downstairs. Um, our booth number is? 208. 208. And please come. Even if you're just a horror fan, we'd love to have you join us. We do all kinds of funny fun things and socialize and hang out and talk about horror. Um, I'm on the panel because I am a horror writer. I've been a horror writer for many, many years. Um, I was one of the original members of the Horror Writers Association and I'm devoted to it. I've written a lot of books that are called tie-in books. And so I've written books based on the TV shows such as Teen Wolf, Buffy the Vampire Slayer, Angel. I wrote the guidebooks to the uh, shows, the episode guides. Um, I've written more fiction about Buffy than anybody on the planet that's not fanfic, and I am a fanfic writer too. So, um, I've done a lot of things, I've received some Bram Stoker Awards, I've been on the New York Times bestseller list, and um, I'm also an editor for a comic book company. I'm just really stoked to see you guys, and I can't wait to talk about more. By the way, Nancy doesn't ever eat, she's too busy writing. <laughs> she has no time to eat. Hi, I'm Lisa Morton. Um, thank you all for coming on a Sunday morning. I almost didn't manage it myself, but um, I am a surprise horror writer. I've worked in the past as a screenwriter. Um, I am a Halloween expert, hence this thing that's on my wrist. Um, I'll be happy to answer any questions anyone has about Halloween as well. Um, my most recent book is Zombie Apocalypse, Washington, D.C. Yes, it has an awesome cover with a zombie Sarah Palin on it. Um, that just came out from, yeah. That just came out from Carolyn Graff, uh, or Running Press now, Constable Robinson. Um, I'm also Vice President of the Horror Writers Organization, the Parent Organization. So I am happy to answer any questions anybody might have about what HWA does, about our awards, about our yearly gatherings, um, and I also love just talking about horror. Hi, I'm Dan, and I'm an alcoholic. <laughs> Hi, Dan. We don't know him, we pick him up that way. Uh, Dan Lamont, I'm a, a television writer, producer, I create shows. I've read the New York Times, that's how it is. Um, and uh, what else? I, I cut my teeth before. You know, when I first started writing, I didn't really start writing seriously until I was in my late 20s. The first thing I wrote was a horror book, and so I was very much influenced by horror. I'm not quite sure what modern horror is, because I think that modern horror is basically a one vast continuum, um, but uh, I guess we'll all try to figure that out while we're here. And I had intended, before we actually open up, to do a plug for HWA, but it beat me to it. So I just want to add that if you are interested in the horror writing, um, we are in the booth downstairs. Sign up. Um, you can come to a meeting. It doesn't cost anything. And, and uh, well, yeah, it doesn't. Yeah, I know. We charge you. <laughs> we charge you. He's the television, so he has the money. Um, and definitely sign up at the booth. Um, uh, we meet in uh, North Hollywood. 
North Hollywood once a month, and it's a really great. If you're if you're a young writer, um, it's also wonderful because uh, we we have a whole section where we talk about what markets are available to various people, so you can get your stuff out there. Um, I I think that I, I you know this is a little arrogant, but um, I'm going to start out by. Um, if you're asking the question is what is more modern horror, um, could we have HWA members raise their, their hands in the audience? Okay, and everybody. We, hello, there's one there too. Um, we kind of are modern horror. We're, we're, the, we're the kind of people creating it right now. Um, but I think that what the panel is probably about is, is thematically what is modern horror. horror. So why don't we start out with the first question, which is when we're talking about modern horror, and, and Nancy may be able to build it off for us. My first question is, what do we kind of come to a general consensus about? What is it we mean by modern? Time-wise, what would we consider to be modern horror, and why? And why? Um, the history of the horror genre is very interesting, because in the um, 70s, um, Stephen King, Peter Straub, uh, a member of uh, Ira Levin, who wrote Rosemary's Baby, um, they became prominent, they started having movies come out, and that caused a horror boom. It was a huge boom. A lot of horror writers were making lots of money in the 80s, and then it collapsed because there were too many titles. Um, and for their long time, you could not say, I'm, I'm trying to sell a horror novel, and had to be a psychological thriller, or had to have supernatural overtones, and you could not say the word horror, it was evil. And so after a while, that, that fallow time ended. So I would say that the new wave of modern horror started in the 90s. And um, a lot of it was fueled, in my opinion, by um, Japanese and Korean films, which I think are fabulous. Uh, they're kind of ambiguous, open-ended. Um, we've already had Dracula and the Wolfman and the tropes. So now modern horror writers, I believe, take those tropes and do amazing, weird shit with them. And I think we are in a huge renaissance of horror, and I'm just so excited to be part of it. You were, you were here back in, uh, she's 29, by the way. She's 29 years old. I just don't make no sleep. Uh, but you were around in the early days. I mean, you were you were around the heyday, you know. Um, have you seen a marked difference between what is modern now and what was traditional then? And yes. Um, back in the day, um, in this early boom, there were a lot of books that were extremely derivative, and I called them deadly puppet books. And they were like, you'd see a cover with a kid with glowing eyes and a pumpkin and a moon. It was a black cover with orange letters, you know, it was a horror novel. And, um, You've seen the cover of my first book. Maybe. Um, I have those covers. But, um, <laughs> but I think nowadays um, what has happened is, what was the question now? It was, it was heavy. You were here in the beginning. Oh, yeah, 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 and, right, right. Yeah. and I think that there was just such a huge, vast, repetitious cycle. I mean, how many evil kid books and how many haunted, it's, it's a haunted house. Like, well, yeah. And so now we start out in the haunted house and move forward. Whereas in the early days, it was kind of like defining things for people. Like, you've never read a horror novel. Here it is. Here's all the scary stuff. And now we just jump to the chase. And I have to say that Asian film industry, I think, created a lot of that. And before the Asian film industry, I think that the Australian uh, Peter Weir and all those weird Australian films that came out in the 70s propelled the J-horror, propelled us. So I, I'm really happy that we're in LA because I think this, this all this confluence of more sophisticated, being able to jump to the chase sooner um, has occurred because of all this mix. Cool. Now, Liz, do you agree that modern horror is kind of like that post '90s, post King, or would you would you make that a different? Well, the one, there's one thing I want to say right off the bat about modern horror, which is I I think if you walked up to ten people on the street, you know, people standing in line at the bank, people shopping at the grocery store, and said, "What is modern horror?" You'd get blood and guts. Sure. Yeah. Ten of those people would say blood and guts, um, and that came out of that. Uh, in the 80s, there was a there was a sort of side movement that came out of that fictional thing in the 80s, um, which was what they now call extreme fiction. Um, the emphasis is on blood, torture, mutilation, splatter, and that's also transcended into the films. You know, we in the early 2000s we went through the cycles of Hostel and Saw and all that, and and the genre became so associated with blood and guts that. It, for a while, it almost threatened to bury everything. And just, I think, in the, just in the last five years, we're starting to realize, you know, there is so much more to it than that, and we're getting past that. And yeah, it's really exciting. We are, I mean, 
I, I've seen the phrase golden age of horror used for what we're in right now, and I kind of agree with that because we're getting past a lot of those things. Um, the genre is expanding, the genre is starting to be recognized by certain mainstream things. For a long time, another problem with horror was that you would pick up something like, you know, the New York Review of Books, and they would review a great horror novel, and they would never use the word horror, or they would be very dismissive reviewing an excellent, obvious horror novel. And I just, it just like within the last two years, I've seen us starting to get past that. Well, there was a, there was a time when, when bookstores did not have horror sections. Right. I mean, what was the book we, we fought with Barnes? It was a Barnes and Noble, where they did not have a horror section. We had to fight for that to come in. So it was a, it was a dirty word. We, we were listed under fiction or worse science fiction. But um, let me ask you a, a follow-up question on that, Lisa. When you're talking about the blood and guts and everything, and, and Nancy mentioned Japanese film, do you think that, that that movement for blood and guts, and then, as a second part of that question, that movement away from that, has been um, instigated, for lack of a better word, by cinema or literature? Yeah, I, it, it kind of feeds off each other in this genre. That's one of the interesting things about horror is I think we're the, the genre where cinema and literature are most interrelated. Um, and it seemed like it started kind of with literature, although even the literature was driven by the zombie films, the Romero stuff that came out of the 70s. So it just, I don't know, it's so back and forth in yeah, horror. Yeah, I, I think they really hold in Europe to each other. I would say that, I'd say that, that even the Splatterpunk movement definitely had an influence on what people thought they could do on the film. But I think, I think, I think really the reason it's kind of stopped, it, it really has very little to do with any kind of giant social trend as much as it's just fallen out of fashion. And, you know, it's like everybody says, okay, I've seen that nine hundred times, I don't want to see that anymore. Like, what, do you, what else do you got? What scares me? You know? I find that the whole idea of modern horror, I guess if I was going to say, I mean, just, it's just an arbitrary demarcation line, I'd call it Clive Barker from the first the modern group. Um, and he, he actually was hugely influential on my own work, only because with Clive, it was like, oh my God, you can do that, you know? And he had this heavy mix, this sort of devil's brew of sex and horror that was, you know, I mean, it, is, it truly instills dread where it counts, you know, right down below the pit of your stomach. And to me, dread is what defines horror as a genre. It's not boo, it's not oh, how gross, it's not bad. I mean, that's why people talk about American Horror Story, and I say, well, it's not really a horror show. It's because you're never really scared watching American Horror Story. Sure, there's some moments in it. But that's, again, the function of the medium. You, you really cannot, outside of HBO or Showtime, where you have, you know, you know 48 minutes of uninterrupted storytelling, um, you cannot, you can't do dread and, on TV. And, and dread is something that's a slow build, and you need time, and you can't interrupt it. It has to just slowly build, and that's what you see in a Hitchcock movie. And you ratchet up that tension, and maybe release it with a little comic release, and then ratchet it up some more. I mean, the most masterful example in my book is The Shining, um, followed by The Exorcist, is where you've got this sense of just, oh my God, something terrible is going to happen any minute now, and, you're, and they sustain that. You know? So, so then how, do you, how would you define then, you know, what the horror element of modern horror? Is for you, I or what it should be. I think the horror. I think. The, I think. I think. Well, then we have to start talking about just cosmetic differences. I, I think the basis for horror is dread. Okay. Is is a sense of absolute oppressive dread. If you can instill that in the reader and viewer, that's the gold standard as far as I'm concerned for horror. It's not about shocking people. It's not about surprising people. It's about instilling dread. Um, and 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 and. and, and you know, Bram Stoker did it, and it's continued with Frankenstein and all the way up to where we are now. I think the modern elements are, we're competing with this. I mean, and I don't mean what the TV it? show, I mean Walter, Walter. It, it, the, it, this is the big, this is the scariest monster I've ever seen on TV, you know? Who is that? Um, Bram Stoker. Oh, okay. I mean, uh, to, to me, the thing that's hard is, you know, I think that Bram Stoker kind of had a little bit easy. Because 
he didn't wake up in the morning and open up the newspaper and read about some guy walking into a, 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 a school and slaughtering a bunch of kids. You know? then let's, let's talk about that for a minute. We, we, got, we got competition now. <laughs> yeah, but let's, let's, you're right about it. Let's, let's talk about that for a minute. We are supposed to be artists. We're, you know, we're creative. We're creating these things in, in, in literature or TV or whatever. And we have this horrible competition. Um, we have... Well, not only that, we have this pressure. Right? MTV came to me, and, and the, the, there was a project out, and they wanted to do a teenage version of Dexter. Whoa! Okay? And I said, no, I'm not going to do that, except under certain circumstances. Yeah. Why? Well, because I think it's irresponsible. I don't want to have somebody shoving a microphone in my face and saying, why did that person's kid die because some kid was watching this show and thought it would be cool to go out and kill his playmates? Okay? I, have a, I have a real problem with that. I feel responsible as an artist for that. I did tell them, I'll do it if it's a girl. If it's a girl, it's wish fulfillment. It's all about empowerment. And there's not going to be any copycats. If it's a boy, there absolutely are going to be copycats. I'm not going to do it. They said, no. Well, you know, I mean, as far as I'm concerned, in TV, I don't think they, I think they need their young, so they don't know what it's like to be a responsible, like, parent. Um, but, um, you know, there is that. So the, it's not just the, the feeling of responsibility you have to not Did have people do what you're writing. It's you interesting, know, that, 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 that instills in me this desire, I have, like, this, you know the Buffy question I want to ask you, but it's completely off topic, <laughs> about the, the episode in Buffy that they pulled, because of that exact reason. Oh, you're tough. Yeah. You did? No, oh, they did. Okay. Yeah, I mean, you all know that, right? There was an episode. But I don't think, Delta, I yeah. see, I don't think Rand Stoker was going, oh, God, I can't do that because somebody's going somebody's to duplicate that behavior, you know, or Frankenstein. I don't think Mary Shelley was going, oh, shit, I hope people will read graveyards and start putting together these corpses. I mean, we have to worry about We have to actually sit there and go, well, don't, you know. Okay, Lisa, let me ask you, because you have some, I know Lisa and I, I probably know Lisa better than anybody else on the panel. You have some very strong feelings about this type of thing. What, what how is, what's, you know, the world going to hell in a handbasket? Yeah. Um, and for lack of a better word, how is that influencing what you're, if it, it, it is even influencing what you're doing as an artist? Is uh, it I, I'm with you 100%. I would have said the same, exact same thing to them. Um, I. It's a really fine line in our genre in terms of responsibility. It's something well, that well, they want to have their TV too right. because they go to their advertisers. They say, "Oh, well, if you put your ads on the TV, you can get people to switch toothpaste." And then when something irresponsible airs and there's a bunch of copycats, they go, "Well, that's not our fault. We don't know that people are gonna emulate this." It's like that's your whole basis for your freaking you know business. And your advertisers are dropping the cocktail. Oh yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, we we read stories. Every year, about some kid who's gone out and, and killed another kid in his family, with a, you know, a Stephen King book in his room, and, and suddenly it comes back to, well, he got that idea from that book. And I, I, I actually wrote a story once about a kid who um, is very troubled and is contemplating a murder at his school and is saved by reading a horror book. I mean, I think we ultimately can do as much good as damage, but it, it is there is responsibility built into it, and and. I love hearing you say that. Yes, they'll make it anyways, which is... No, they didn't. They didn't. No. Good. Um, I wrote a Buffy book that started out with a kid taking a shot in the skull, killing all the kids in the quad, and killing himself in the library. And two weeks before my book was going to come out, Columbine occurred. And I am embarrassed to tell you, as I was watching the news, the first words out of my mouth were, my novel. And Simon and Schuster had an emergency meeting and they put that book on hold for a year. And then I had to rewrite the beginning. And I found out later that one of my best friend's daughter was at Columbine that very day. And she was in therapy for over a year, lost friends. And the first words out of my mouth were, oh my God, my novel. And um, so I'm grateful to Simon and Schuster that they would hold, held that book, but they held it for a year. And so it's freaky deaky when stuff like that happens. What if that book had come out? at that time, I would have felt absolutely horrible, just horrible. So I'm so glad that, you know, I had a gatekeeper, but we don't always. And I think one of the most exciting things about horror right now is in this room are people who are um, specialty press publishers in HWA, and 
they don't go through the gatekeeping of New York. They publish what they want to write or what have, have sold. And um, so we have a lot more freedom than we used to in that way. Um, it's always been small press, but it's like, as you said, the golden age right now. And sometimes you do fly when you have to think, oh, can I do this? Should I do this? I don't have know. You ever, have, you ever all this have you ever taken a tragedy, anyone? Of something horrible. Has, has anyone ever taken the equivalent of a column? Anyone here? And used it? Creative. Well, I would say top rock. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I actually was part of a romance line where we had romances that occurred during disasters because of Titanic. So mine was Pearl Harbor. There was a romance that took place during the attack on Pearl Harbor. Which is true. So Why did they get you right on the That was pretty good, actually. Yeah. Have you ever used anything they say? And how do you feel about that? Um, I don't. I, it's I mean, possible. you have Sarah Taylor. It's your talk. They actually gave me that cover. Um, I don't know, but did, did anybody read the big thing this week about Stephen King? Mm -hmm. and, yes, there, there's a, not, a movie coming out based on a King story called A Good Marriage. And to promote the movie, King has been giving some interviews. And in one interview, he actually revealed that the uh, inspiration for this original short story was the BTK killer, by and torture kill. And uh, what, what he was interested in was the idea that this was a man who had killed 10 people in incredibly horrific ways and had a family that didn't know. Uh, so he approached the story from the point of view of the wife. And now the BTK killer's daughter has come out and said he's exploiting the yeah, situation. She's freaking out. Yeah. She's really freaking out in the press right now. Yeah, yeah. I think, I think you know, and all this, uh, and, and yeah, all this said, the, the, I've never done that. I've never, so, I mean, I know that I have, but not consciously. Um, I think all that said, though, you have to go, you know, as, as an artist, again, you can't, so, I mean, there's so much that's so overtly responsible. And you go, man, this is just crazy. This is like handing a kind of a kid in a bottle of, a bottle of See, I read, I read, but there, there's some things where it's like, you know, like, the, I don't think that Beatles are responsible for the tape killings, you know? I mean, there's certain things where there's always going to be some knot that gets your stuff, and, and, and maybe that makes them spire off, but that means that you get something, like on, on this on a show, two million people watch it, and one guy does some crazy shit. Um, I, I can't really say that's my fault, but I, there are certain types of things we, if you get, I, I think it would be a check. Yeah. I, would, I would, for example, never include a passage that described in detail how to manufacture a bomb. Right. That's, that's a simple act of response. To See, I think, they, I mean, I tend to write comedy, I and mean, I do write some, some pretty graphic horror, but I tend to write comedy, so I'm always looking for topical things. I mean, I'm always looking for something because, you know, my, my you know, it's interesting, I recently heard uh, the John Rivers, uh, uh, a tape of John Rivers making a joke about 9-11, um, and it's really, really tough to do, and what, and it actually was a successful joke, um, but she, she said, when she was making this joke, um, she said, if you can't laugh, what choice do you have? but to fall apart. And I mean, you know, as artists, you know, at least for me, that's the way I, that's the way I look at some of these horrible things, is I, I have to use it for, as fodder for comedy, otherwise I couldn't feel it. So I think, I think, I think really in modern horror, and yeah, if you talk about modern horror, I think, what, what, I think, I think what it is, is it's informed by, and I, uh, and I hate to say it, I mean, it's, I don't know if you use the word, um, sophisticated, um, but people have seen more, heard more. Um, they're not gonna, you know, they're not gonna gasp if they, you know, if they, if people have gotten need to be sensitized to some degree. And the, the, the lazy man's way of getting around that is do something bigger, bloodier, grosser, scarier, top out. But, but, but what, Nancy, what Nancy was suggesting earlier was that we are entering into an era of, in terms of modern, where we're going, it, in a weird, I don't know if this is the right way for it, responsible horror? No, no, no. <laughs> no. Um, and I would not want, I would not want my fellow authors to put their gloves on or take them off or whatever, that would be that analogy. Um, because as, uh, hard getting back to Clive Barker, Clive Barker has said, 
that writers are the ones who go into the dark cave and come back and tell the tribe what they saw. And I, I loved what you said about Drip. I think you're 100% right on them. Um, we can go, there's really scary that it's a vampire. Oh, okay, I've seen like a lot of vampire movies. You know, we, we have to instill that dread, and that is an art. That is an art to be able to do that. And I think that dread, instead of revulsion, which is what the saw cycles were about, but it was fun. It was fun to be um, so tough I could watch saw. I mean, I get yeah. why they were there. Well, dread, uh, dread requires uh, a certain groundedness. Exactly. It requires a in a very very a deep deep down to deep character work. Right. where people really care about what's happening to this person, you know. Um, your, your reader, your viewer, they have to be invested in order to, to, in order to experience threat. They have to care. Whereas, you know, if it's pop them up, you know, shot them deep at, well, who gives a shit? You know, I, I don't know, I, I have a wow, that was gross, what a great special effect. Next! You know, I actually think of that kind of stuff as pornography. I don't call it horror. It really is. It's because it serious. exists solely to evoke a visceral, physical response. Well, it's analogous to it, I think. I wouldn't call it pornographic, but I would say it's, it's, it's sort of like, you know, it's a series of people that aren't really people being having horrible things done to them. So are we, are we seeing, I mean, you know, I, I have a fondness for the monster, you know, which is traditional horror. I mean, I have a fondness for the vampire, the werewolf, not the zombie so much, but I'm like, are we going to see, do y'all think that, that in modern days we're going to see less of the monster and more of the monster's effect? No, we, uh, we see monsters. We okay. Like this guy. I mean, we see monsters. They're not there. Um, I want to do a shout out, and I think if there were a new, um, new person like this person, we would be in for some treats. But um, even though he's an older producer, um, if you are interested in Dread, um, you should watch the films that were produced by a man named Val Luton. Um, he did the original Cat People, he did the Body Snatcher, of course, Carlock. Um, he's one of my personal heroes, and they're fabulous, scary, creepy movies, and they are monster movies. There's some kind of monster in But there's Dread. There's Super Dread. Yeah. And I think if you have a monster movie with Dread, then you maybe judge Dread. Um, <laughs> then you, I think you got it. I, there was there was a, a lovely movie that I'm very fond. I don't I'm I'm one of the few horror writers I know that doesn't watch horror movies because I don't like being scared. <laughs> um, I just I can't it freaks me out. But but uh, uh, my husband had me watch a film called Cheapers Creepers that I just loved because it was an old fashioned monster movie and even in the country. But the Jeepers Creeps, I just love that movie because it was an old-fashioned monster movie. And yet there was this horrible sense of doom and inescape, inevitability, yeah. which I just love. I didn't sleep for like a week. Another, another old film is the 1963 or 64 version of The Haunting with Julie Harris. <laughs> yeah, I can't do the remake. The remake is horrible. Yeah. But it is so creepy. And some of the effects that he's in that movie are in The Haunted Mansion at Disneyland. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, Russ Tamlin, uh, just Paris Hilton, Alex Ross, excellent. Yeah. Yeah. Creepy, scary, as all get out. Yeah. 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 But it, it's so, so much, there's great sound design and so forth in it. Let's ask, let's ask, ask a question. Let me, let me just turn on the music and this is something that's probably all time ago. I have a big mic, I can say that. Um, Your mic is the biggest. My mic's the biggest. I have a big mic. Um, it's wired. <laughs> <laughs> the man. Um, we're talking about monsters a minute ago. I, I love the idea of the sympathetic monster in horror. And I started to see that probably with Chelsea Quinn Yarbrough's books, her Saint Germain vampire series. She was kind of the first person to take the vampire and make him sympathetic. And I'm seeing more and more and more of that to the point where it's starting to become cliche itself. Yeah, the first one was Mary Shelley, of course. But yeah. Well, except the fact he's a mass murderer. Not the 
<laughs> but, I mean, do we do we see any of that? I mean, I mean, turning stuff on its head so that horror becomes. I mean, we've had the, we we we're doing a modern horror where it's coming. I mean, we have fluffy vampires now. Sparkly. Well, we did that. We did that with that on, on NBC. We we just did a Dracula special where yeah. it was yes. And, and really all we do is we knew that he's the protagonist now. And it's not a story. Well, you, you know, the, the antagonist can't drive a story. Right. right. Um, Unless it's Japanese. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, but it's just, see, we, what we had to do is come up with somebody, something that was worse than Dracula. That he's fighting against and turning into a little bit story. So he became, although he was just as, you know, he was just as bloodthirsty and ruthless and so sort of despicable. He, he, he was fighting against something that was even worse than he is. You know, which is basically the only thing, to me, what trumps a bad person is his institutional mm -hmm. murder. <laughs> you know, and so, you know, that's where things get real. As soon as you've got, as soon as you've got, as soon as you've got a society or a, or a political machine that says it's okay to kill people, yeah, I think when, when we're talking about Tony Dracula, Lisa has a lovely story about, um, which one is it? It's the Dracula, Dracula versus Edward story. Her oh, short story. She has a wonderful piece, if you haven't read, where, where basically it's, it's, it's the real vampires versus the sparkly vampires. Uh, it's actually a hoot. Did they kick around? What's it in? What's it in? It's in a uh, short story collection called Monsters of Edward. Yeah. We, we have a big sign on the wall of Dracula saying the sparkly. <laughs> I will also point out that in the original Frankenstein by Mary Shelley, Frank the monster it is quite sympathetic. Um, he's abandoned by his creator. He is he discovers he's hideous. <coughs> he hides out in the um, part of a house of some people who speak French. He learns French. Yeah. That's his first language. When the monster in Frankenstein is Dr. Frankenstein. Yes. Because yeah. yeah. he abandons his own. Well, it's creation. called Frankenstein because it's Frankenstein's monster. Frankenstein is the well, and it's Frankenstein colon Prometheus unbound. This is the code of modern world. Uh, Which I have. But, but, but it is, you know, there's always a genesis, and I think that's, if you're a horror, if you're interested in horror, go backwards too, because that's where you say, oh, this happened, and then this happened. Oh, I see how this happened. And um, it, it gives you a sense of a we really have a real legacy, and it's We do. Okay, so Frankenstein was, Frankenstein was 1780-something yet? 80. 1812. It was, it was, it was yeah, Roman period. So, the, so we've got Frankenstein there. We, I told you I needed my eyebrow for this. Nothing more. Um, <laughs> a flash of mind. Really? Um, we've got Dracula in 1898. Okay. We're right here all week. Yeah. Um, um, and then we've got you know Stephen King, the Golden Age, and and, and we're we're now in 2014. What's left? Where are we going? I mean, I, I, I hate to ask that question, what's the future of R? Because I think it's a bonus question, but, but what's left for us? Where are we going to explore next? What are we going to do? Um, I have a strong opinion about this. Um, I went to the H.P. Lovecraft um, Film Festival of CthulhuCon in San Pedro yesterday, and um, Les Klinger, who's just done the annotated H.P. Lovecraft and is an HWA LA member, um, wrote, read something that Lovecraft wrote, and um, he said, Whatever anybody else thinks of what I do, my aim is to be sincere. My aim is to really explore what I'm interested in and how I feel. And I think because of the freedom that we have now with more places to, to place work, the, the thing of horror now is to be truly sincere about it, and I think that's really cool. Um, a lot of times people do go for the shock value, or you know, even, I mean, even as a commercial creator, and I think that we now have a chance to explore themes that maybe before we would not have a venue. So we're encouraged to do it because most writers want to be read or viewed. And so I think that right now we're in a, a phase of really taking it very seriously as an art form and a form. Let, let me ask you a question, follow up question on that. Um, we all know about this thing called Twilight, right? Did, what about, I mean, on the one side you're saying we have to be sincere, we have to be true to ourselves as artists, we have to go where we need to go. I get that. But what about the fact that now, especially when it comes to creating art on the internet, it's so easy for anyone to create art, even if they're not artistic or not trained as an artist. And, and in art, there's, there's two elements. There's natural talent, then there's the craft. 
um, so that all of a sudden you have five million twilights. Or this, this, this Fifty Shades, which is a really a, a horror thing, but we got, we got Fifty Shades of Grey, then, Grey, then we got the zombie Fifty Shades of Decay, then we got Fifty Shades of this, and Fifty Shades of that. I mean, you know. Well, I think, I think, I think uh, the, the straight answer is um, when it came to mass media, which you know it is, uh, used to take um, these, the, there was a chasm between the artists and the audience. And uh, that took a tremendous amount of, of, of capital investment and effort to create a distribution system that would cross that count, which required guys in suits. And the guys in suits were the trolls who ran the bridges. And the guys in suits said, who gets to megaphone? Who gets to have the megaphone? Who's worthy of the megaphone? And so it was sort of arbitrarily decided by guys in suits who everybody would get to hear from. Well, that doesn't exist anymore. My feeling is, anybody wants to sit down and publish their short story or put their short film or do whatever the hell they want on the internet and put it up, by God, you know, it's going to rise or fall by its own merits. The signal-to-noise ratio is very, very loud. But I don't care. I think it's cool. I think it's, you have instant worldwide distribution. Do you think it's cool, Dan? It just makes it harder. You just have to be on, you have to play your A game. Yeah. What's, you're not going to see artists coasting once they make it. It's going to, you have to stay on your A game. You have to reinvent and do your best. And that's great for everybody. How do you feel about the popularity of your stuff? Because oh, you have some referential stuff where it's like we're doing. Yeah. No, we're talking about the uh, right of people that are basically rewriting Twilight. I mean, back in the day. Oh, fan fiction? Not even fan fiction. I love fan fiction. Yeah, no, I'm not even fan fiction. What a big <laughs> I mean, I'm, I'm going back to Sense and Sensibility. And, oh, Sense and Sensibility and Zombies. And Zombies and Prime Pressure Zombies. I think it's cute. I mean, it's cute. Okay. No problem. It's, and I have to go on record. I need to say this. Um, I, I know that a lot of people in horror don't like Twilight. And um, I read the first Twilight book and I thought it was fabulous. I thought that what she wanted to do, she did. And whatever your opinion is of her, her approach, what as a writer she was totally on. And I know that the writing was rough. And I do. But I think the, the she was balled out doing exactly what she wanted to do. And I admire that. And um, so I have to say that as a, as a writer, while I wouldn't say I think Twilight's a good book, I think it was a great creative effort. I really do. I think she gave people what they wanted to read. I mean, obviously. It was what she wanted to write. Yeah. That is what she wanted to read. That is what she wanted to read. So. I mean, really, that's, yeah. that's, that's, that's what I do. Yeah. It's like people go, wow, you know, i got to go out and sell a show. i got to pitch a show. What's on? What's on? Gee, what are they buying? What's on? I always just go, what's not on? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I just go, what's not on that I want to watch? Maybe I'll make it and I'll get to watch it. <laughs> <laughs> we're, since we're, since we're, and again, since we're coming to the future of art, where do you go? I'm going to ask Lisa this because Lisa didn't want to put her on the spot. Yeah, sure. Where do you go after you made Dracula into the good guy? Where do you go from? Lisa died ass. I know, but I want your opinion. Well, I was going to say one of the interesting things about monsters, and I think one of the interesting things about modern horror, there's always been a subtext of the monster being sympathetic. The monster always represents some part of us we wish we could act out on. You know, the werewolf is, is our savagery that we can bury. The vampire is, is our desire to, to maybe uh, to live forever, but at the expense of other people. Like you can go into every monster and you can find Godzilla. You know, who doesn't want to stop down a city from time to time? And one of the things that's interesting about modern horror is that because we now have 200 years of horror fiction and monsters behind us, we can now look at that subtext and make it the overtext. Oh, you're such a genius! <laughs> so that's one of the things that I like. I love reading these things, or seeing like Daniel's uh, take on Dracula, where the, the everything is flipped, where the monster now becomes the hero, and, and the, the humans, you know, are, are the bad guys. And um, yeah, so that's. Okay. So then I'll ask Daniel, where do you go after? You know, now that you've gotten to the stage where Lisa says we can do this, which is great. Where do you go after you've made, you've gotten into that overtax and you, you've made Dracula the hero? Well, I mean, that was just, that's, that's one, that's one direction to go. I mean, I, to me, I think it's just, to me it's trying to, it's, it's looking and, 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 and you see something that terrifies you and you 
and you, and you, and you just do your best to instill that care in your reader, your viewer, whatever. And I mean, it's like, I, I, I was just going to say, I was like, I mean, I've, I've, I've created monsters. I've, I've created monsters. You know, I've done that, I've made monsters. And I, I, I'm going to read to you. I'm going to read something to you that I wrote, okay? And this is the scariest monster I've ever created. This is really the scariest monster I've ever created. It's called This Is How Much. This is how much I love you. I will buy you a house that I live in and a car that I drive. I will keep the keys because you are a pair and you may hurt yourself. And we wouldn't want that, would we? I will launder, you will launder my socks and pick up after me and fuck me. And I will hug you and look into your eyes and I will ask you in a honey sweet baby voice if you are still mad about last night when your father told you you are worthless, that lots of girls get touched, your mother got touched, and you don't see her mom be moving around, do you? Get over it, he said. Grow up, he said. And I just sat there. I said nothing. Are you still mad about that, my sweet? Because you know I love you, and everything I'm doing is for your own good. And just to prove it once and for all, I will tell you the truth about your dreams and your heart and all those silly things you think are so important. You don't need them. After all, you have me now. And I will help you finally see that you are not really that talented or smart or beautiful, and it is such a good thing, such a fine, fine thing that I am in your life, because without me, you are nothing. Now that was just a little profile of my given future. Okay? This is happening. This is happening. To 100,000, to a million women, to a million men, by the way. Those are the monsters. We just have to put them on a fucking page. Let's, uh, let's, on that, up oh, no. I'm going to put blue to happiness, guys. Ah, let's hope how to blow it to practice. So, horror, are you defining it? I mean, horror seems to be, can be almost any genre. It's one of those, like science fiction, you can transcend. You can put anything into it, and it can go anywhere. Horror is a true detective now. Lovecraft and all that. But how are you guys defining horror, the horror writers? as super, having supernatural elements, or just that dread, that sense of, you know, something like, you know, I, I actually have a really an answer because I've thought a lot about that and I think it's very simple. What is the primary intention of something? I don't call true detective horror, it has horror elements, but its primary intention is not to disturb or horrify you. So to me it's very simple. Um, Whereas, um, you know, I can, I can read a horror novel that might have action or romance elements, but its primary intent is absolutely to make me go, you know, and that's, that's a horror novel. One of the seminal works that we claim as a horror novel, for example, is Silence of the Lambs. Um, we think that's a horror novel. It's scary, it's creepy, there's dread, and um, some horror writers will argue there is no such thing as a horror genre, that it's an atmosphere, it's a feeling and emotion, and that can translate and transcend any genre, but I agree with you. Just I, 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 argue, I, argue, I would argue that if there's a, it needs a supernatural element. And so I'd say, I think you can instill horror in people, but I think for for me, that's sort of like, that falls into thriller territory. Right. Like that, if you, what do you, what do you, you don't spoil it, you don't say every Alfred Hitchcock is a horror, you know, but it's, you know, well, like it's, it's too broad for me, I want, yeah. it's got to be a supernatural. What about Psycho? I would say that's a thriller. Okay, thriller. what about Jack Ketchum? I mean, Jack Ketchum is probably one of the, 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 the yeah, well, okay. <laughs> Dallas is cute. Um, he's one of the primo horror, horror writers, and, and Dallas will clearly say I'm a horror writer. And I don't think, I can't off the top of my head, aside from one ghost story, remember anything Dallas did that was supernatural. Well, I will say in that horror writer, we have the Bram Stoker Awards, and in our our purview, we would accept what you may call a thriller as a horror, as a submission for the awards. And um, I, I think, didn't Sounds of the Lambs or Red Dragon, something won one year, I think. But we do, we do, as, and just as an FYI, I'm not arguing with you, just oh, no. we would accept yeah, this not a, That's just my opinion. Yeah. Everybody's got <laughs> But I mean, I think, I think the answer is both. I mean, you have the monster, I mean, you have that monster uh, horror, um, you know, on the one hand, you have a writer like Brian Keene that's writing all the zombie stuff, and then on the other hand, you have uh, somebody who's writing, you know, Stephen King is writing, you know, The Overlook, you know, Haunted Hotel, and then you've got somebody like Jack Ketchum 
who's, who's writing about a guy who, who wants revenge because somebody killed his dog. Um, which is that if you've read Red, it's, it, it's not only, it's, I, I don't think there's any question, it's a hard one. Because what he's asking, the question he's asking is, even if you're right, how far can you go? I mean, when do you stop? And I'm, there's nothing supernatural in it whatsoever, and it is definitely a girl next door. I mean, it, 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 it's, it's a classic horror novel that somebody could do that to another person. There's nothing supernatural in it. At and all. conversely, things that have the supernatural in them, like Twilight, not horror. Yeah. yeah. Well, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not saying that right. just the supernatural thing. I feel like it has to have this, the dread and, and the supernatural. That's the magic. Um, I also want to give a, um, a plug for another non-supernatural, basically, or writer we claim, uh, who's Joe Lansdale. You might enjoy his work. Joe actually helped found the HWA. Yeah, he was what Do we know you? You know, but okay. what, what about some of the new modern voices in horror? I mean, traditionally horror has been like white guys, you know, old white guys. And we have a whole new... Um, Contention of horror authors coming up that are that are very diverse. Mm -hmm. I mean, look at this. this one. Is really yeah. Um, I want to say that I wanted to give a shout out um, to Haruki Murakami. Um, he wrote Evil on the Mask. He writes some yeah. things you find if you Google him, you'll find excellent Japanese. He's been translated into English. Uh, I, yeah, it's funny you would bring that up because I just did a, a radio interview the other day and they asked me about. Um, what I thought was the most exciting trend in modern horror, and I actually said the new diversity of voices. Um, you know, a lot of people think it's a misogynist genre, and frankly it was for a long time. Um, not anymore. There are, uh, I am so excited by all the new women writers coming in. There are people of color, there are people from outside of North America. It's, it's, that's probably my favorite thing that I see happening in the genre. You know, um, there's cool. an Angelino named uh, Tadana Reef Du, and she's yep. an excellent. Well, she's been around for a while, but people are discovering. I like, you know, I like the stuff. I love the stuff they're doing. You know, the, the Korean stuff. The, yeah. The, 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 the um, you know, uh, the you know, Spain, Mexico. There's just some great stuff coming out. It's much more interesting. Than a lot of stuff coming out here. Kevin, there was something you said about uh, having a, uh, an affinity for the classic monsters. Um, yeah. when, Especially you, uh, Janet, it seems like you're more involved in the film than the other, and you go through more since you book or... I'm not a real writer. These, yeah. guys, these guys are real writers. He doesn't even read. All he reads is coverage. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I, I can barely read that. Yeah. <laughs> um, I have an assistant who does pictograms. And, uh, uh, yeah. Well, my question was, um, how do you feel about the, the excess in or at least in more films, like the, um, like the, the I Frankenstein that came out last year, where I was kind of looking forward to it because I like, I like classic monsters. And, and it just was so over the top in every area. And I see the same thing with the trailer for the new Dracula, which I, I, I like your show on NBC. I thought you did a good job. But this new movie looks like it's just excess. And it seems like everything is not so much about making an intimate horror film, but about bigger, louder, um, more effects, and it, to me, sometimes it drives the, the horror element away and makes it more more fantastical, maybe, but not. Well, I think I think if you're going to find real horror, the movies is probably not the place to look for it. I think most movies kind of boil. There's a. I mean, what you're talking about, I mean, in James Bond films. I mean, it does not just horror. I mean, I watched those last two James Bond films. And I could, I have lots of explosions of people running around, I couldn't find them. Well, we could all do a collective thank you but, to Francois Truffaut for coming up with the auteur theory, which put the director in charge of film. <laughs> <laughs> and really what that no. did is it ruined films. It's, TV's good because it's a writer's medium, and writers still basically in charge of the director is my bitch. And um, he's there to direct traffic. That's, that's it. And, and, the fact of the matter is when you put a director in charge, which they do, and you've got people who are, you know, it's now, they've got possessory credit, so it's the director's name with apostrophe and an S, and it's the movie, and he's done one film. You know, I mean, I got it when it was Hitchcock, but I don't get it now when it's Joe Blow's Frankenstein. But when that happens, what it, what it all becomes about as a director is all about set pieces, and, 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 and explosions, and moments. That's all he sees. Now, I'll go to a popcorn movie and I'll enjoy it as much as the next guy. 
of really the really kind of modern blockbuster film. It's not a story, it's a pageant. It's like going to a fireworks show. Yeah. You go to the fireworks show, you enjoy it thoroughly, and you walk out, and if somebody says, well, what was that about? You go, <laughs> well, yeah, there was this part where the robot came down, and that was kind of awesome. You know, the the film is the problem. You forget the, the plot. Just, you, don't, you can't retain it, because there isn't. It's like a series of moments connected by the very thinnest of narrative threads, and then the next big moment, and then the next big moment. And, and, and so that's, that's movies now. So I, I, sadly, I think until you get into like, smaller budget films, where people are, you know, hippie stuff, you're just not going to see that much good horror on the big screen. I mean, you're not going to see, you know, you know, because these don't have supernatural elements, but, but there's movies like Martyrs and Audition, which are just completely terrifying. Those are not big movies, and you're not going to see those come out of, you know, it's not going to be like 120 hours. The gentleman over here, Oh, sorry. Yeah. This, this might be a dumb question, but. No, this is never <laughs> Since you brought up uh, Frankenstein, Mary, well, Mary Shelley wrote Frankenstein, I mean, we, we can infer that she basically preyed on the people's fear at the time that technology was moving too fast. Right. So, in, you, in your opinion, what is the common fear now that can become that monster? I think that's why zombie fiction is so popular. Um, I think that there's a sense of, first of all, I think that everybody thinks it's groovy to like zombies because it's kind of uncivilized, it's gross. Zombies are gross. And have bad manners, and why I like them. And I think that's part of the reason. But I think there's this fear of um, becoming the other, of, be, of turning into something evil. And in the case of a zombie, you can't help it. So I think that would be. I, I think a, a big fear right now is that we've lost control of our lives. Mm -hmm. um, and one of the things that makes zombie fiction and cinema so popular is because all you need to do to reestablish control is pick up a gun. You know, and um, so I think that's a big fear. I, I think, I, I, again, I think it's a continuum. I think it goes back to the very beginning. I think some, some guy came up and told a scary story in a cave. Yeah. I think the biggest fear we have is being consumed, is being consumed by something. And, and, and really, that's what, that's what the zombie thing is. You just have to find what's, what are people scared of being consumed by right now? And, Right now, I think it's, it's being consumed by just all these people in the way of the price club. <laughs> <laughs> okay, the jump over here. Um, you did mention you know, like audition and stuff like that. Sorry. You did mention like audition and stuff being in this foreign film. And are, you doing, are they doing a better job right now in, you know, like in film with directing? Well, I think there's. Let me just repeat the question. Okay. He's asking in foreign. Markets, foreign films are doing a better job now in instilling dread and in making horror. There's a. Oh, well, I was just thinking, what, 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 what's interesting to me is because the, the, there's been so much sameness in the voices in, in, as far as culturally, mm -hmm. okay, it's very interesting to see something from a different culture. And they're, they're tapping into something else that's, that's dreadful. With the Japanese, there's, there's mm -hmm. you know, there's, there's, it's about, it's about, there's always the telephones. Right, you know, right. And hair. Yeah. You know, <laughs> you know, but I mean, things, you know, um, and so it's kind of cool just to see something. You know. One of my favorite um, things that's happening is Guillermo del Toro is a um, nurturing protégés. And um, one of his protégés is named Juan Antonio Bayona, and he did a movie called The Orphanage El Orfanato. It's one of the scariest movies I've ever seen. I love that movie. He was supposed to direct one of the Twilight films. I don't know what happened. I was about to wet my pants. I would have gone to that 28 times. I think um, the Spanish cinema, Mexican cinema, is really strong right now. And I think a lot of it is because of Guillermo del Toro. And I, I also want to say, I heard something that when he wants inspiration, he goes and writes the Haunted Mansion. <laughs> so um, he's one of my guys. But I, anyway, props, huge props to him. Um, and you know, he has the Devil's uh, Backbone, that's, that's the scariest ghost movie ever. Oh, Jesus, yeah. yeah. Um, I think we have time for one more quick question if somebody wants to do it, and then we have a, a video that we have to play. So don't worry about um, you know, Given that, that each genre for each time period is very much about the current fear, you know, um, sci-fi, um, you know, it's, it's giant radioactive monsters, and 
50s, it's the other, whether that be the establishment or what happened, you know, in the 60s and 70s, um, you know, morality plays of the 80s or the slasher films. What do you think about remakes and, you know, the fact that they're doing all these, I mean, I know it's obviously Hollywood looking for more money, but rebooting, you know, an old fear and how that plays into the modern. I think it's awesome. I mean, I've been writing HP Lovecraft pastiches for different anthologies. Great. I mean, let's re let's mix it up again. Uh, if you're talking about Hollywood, I'll say I think it'd be great if they did it right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, right now, I'm right now I'm developing a series that's, that is completely in the world building is completely based on HP Lovecraft. Oh God! And I'm doing it with a major or a figure, which I can't tell you now. But I'll tell you. Justin Bieber. <laughs> Justin Bieber's playing Cthulhu. Yeah, no, Justin Bieber's going to play Cthulhu and dance. <laughs> okay, so I guess we're done. So we have a, uh, a little video that we, we have to see. see. And this is, what is this? is under attack. I wish we could help with Cassio. Yeah! Now you can explore the world of Zorb. Please do not kill me! Father, please go! The love of God finished this!